Welcome. My name is Nick Scaglione. I'm the chair of orthopedic surgery at Northwell Health in New York. And it's a pleasure tonight to welcome all of you to our master class and orthopedics this week. We're uh, going to speak a little bit about arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, optimizing structure and chemistry. I think that the problem at hand that, that we're all very interested in is the complex and challenging issues related to rotator cuff pathology, rotator cuff repair, and trying to understand how to optimize results with the potential of using biologics and in particular bioscaffold. We have a, a world-class faculty tonight for discussion that includes Dr. Wasik Ashraf, who is a, a current practicing sports medicine physician and Chief of Sports Medicine at St. Luke's Montefiore. And in addition, joining Dr. Ashraf, uh, Dr. Brian Badman, who is an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist in Indiana. I feel tonight is an opportunity for us to have an interactive forum. Uh, we will have presentations from our surgeons. I would ask that all of you who have questions, because this is an interactive discussion, place those questions in the Q&A section. I would like to now pass off the screen to Dr. Brian Badman, who's going to take us out in our first presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scaglione, for that introduction uh, today. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm going to go through some of the basic science of, of rotator cuff pathology and some of the pearls and tidbits about optimizing structure and chemistry. So I think by any orthopedic, busy orthopedic surgeon would account uh, shoulder pain and pa patients presenting with shoulder pain is a very common thing that we see uh, in the United States. Uh, rotator cuff disease is really the number one cause of shoulder issues seen by an orthopedic surgeon. And in the United States alone, more than 17 million Americans are impacted annually. <clears throat> the majority of these tears are degenerative in nature. And if you look at this graph, you know, typically the take home is that by the time you are 50, <clears throat> the incidence of a rotator cuff problem uh, starts anywhere from 10 to 30% in some articles. And then every decade thereafter, it increases about 10%. So that by the time you're 80, as this chart shows, about 50% of the time, if you present with shoulder pain, you may have a rotator cuff tear. And I know there's a couple articles that would quote as high as 80% incidence. A lot of what we know about the uh, incidence and natural history of rotator cuff disease can be credited to Dr. Yamaguchi. Uh, and then this is a classic article with a very large series of patients um, where the take home essentially was that if you are under the age of 50 presenting with, with a shoulder problem, the chances of having rotator cuff tear are, are very slim. However, as you enter your 50s, the, ch the chances of having a unilateral tear incrementally go up. And then by the time you're 60, if you present with a symptomatic tear in one shoulder, you've got a more than 50% probability of having a contralateral tear in the other shoulder. So what causes this? Well, we think that the blood supply of the rotator cuff is probably the, the main culprit for why these happen. And there's this zone of hypovascularity between the supra and infraspinatus tendon at the distal portion of the tendon, where the blood supply on the top and the blood supply on the bottom creates this sort of watershed area where a lot of these tears probably emanate from. So like everything else in our body, as we get older, uh, the tendon will stiffen. And as a result of having poor vascularity, instead of healing, the tendon uh, effectively rips away from the bone, resulting in the rotator cuff tears that we see. As described by Dr. Harriman, the rotator cuff may, can be broken down into really five discrete layers um, with the total thickness of the rotator cuff measuring any, approximately about a half of an inch from, from top to bottom. And as a result of these different layers and the different strains and stresses that you can see between the layers, you can develop then these, the, the presence of these intratendinous tears or partial thickness tears that affect either the bursal or the articular side of the tendon. My understanding of tear patterns of the rotator cuff, probably like many, can be credited to the work of Dr. Burkhart, who really described the rotator cuff uh, as much like a suspension bridge 
whereupon you have an anchor column and a pusher column, and this helps support the cable in between. So when you have a crescent-based tear, these are often a, a stable pattern tear. However, as the tear progresses or propagates into either the anchor column or the poster column, this is then where the, the uh, function and loss of motion and what have you uh, can, can develop over time. With that, uh, most of these tear patterns can then be described, uh, again, like Dr. Burkhardt uh, demonstrated with crescent-based tears being the most common, encompassing about 40% of the tears, a U-pattern tear where you get a little bit of slight progression, your L pattern or reverse L pattern tears that then involve either the anchor column or the poster column, and then your massive rotator cuff tears that typically imply more than a two to three tenon involvement. The ultimate goal for me, at least when I'm fixing these, however, is to recognize the tear pattern and, and try to recreate or get it back to that crescent because the crescent is the most stable tear construct. As described by Dr. Elman, partial thickness tears can be uh, really divvied up into the where, where it really uh, occurs on, the, on either the articular side of the tenon or the bursal side of the tenon. And really for me, I think the important part when I'm looking at a rotator cuff and determining whether it's a partial thickness tear is the critical factor for me, does it involve more than 50% of the tenon or is it left less than 50% torn? Because if I see a tear that's more than 50% partially tore, in my opinion, that's a tear that will progress over time. This is sometimes something that's going to be needed to be treated. Again, going back to some of the work of Dr. Yamaguchi, uh, this is a often cited classic uh, uh, study looking at the natural history of rotator cuff tears. And, you know, once you have a tear, it does not heal and they do progress. However, they do not progress over days or weeks. They typically progress over the course of two to three years on average. And so when I'm counseling a patient, um, it's very important that, that they understand that this tear will enlarge over time. And the other take home of this paper is that usually when, when a tear does progress, typically more than 50% of the patients will develop pain. And so again, I, I will oftentimes counsel my patients that if you develop pain and we're sort of going the conservative route, as they have increased pain, it's very important that they come back and we can take a look at it to see if the tear has enlarged. When you're treating uh, rotator cuff tears, I, I do believe that degenerative pattern tears, uh, uh, physical therapy does play a heavy handed role in terms of our management. Um, this is the moon study. Uh, this is an often cited study that was often very much picked up by the insurance companies as well. But you know, the important part of this study, it, this is a large multi-center study with a large series of patients. and and. Really, if you put people through a minimum of three months of therapy, a lot of times, more than 75% of the time, patients were able to avoid surgery. The caveat of this study is that this did exclude traumatic tears. I think that's a whole completely uh, different entity and subset of patients that, that this sort of uh, excluded. But again, I think there is a, therapy is important when we're initially treating these patients. However, as we all know, not everybody gets better with therapy. And so this was, a, I think, a, an interesting study out of the University of Michigan. And they actually looked at two cohorts of patients, one surgical, one non-surgical. And really the take home of this article is that if you do, if the patient is to undergo surgery and they do have a successful outcome, those patients by far and away did better with regards to functional outcomes and pain as compared to the non-operative group. Over the past three decades, um, there's been a lot of great innovation in terms of uh, rotator cuff management. Uh, we went from large open incisions uh, to then sort of the dawn of the arthroscopic error. And I think once we started to, to put, put scopes in things, that's when a lot of the innovation sort of took place uh, with regards to anchors, anchor type and anchor material, uh, suture material, a lot of the polyblend sutures that we have now. Uh, to the varying uh, techniques and the devices that we use to fix these arthroscopically. And now what I would, what I would call the new error, which is, which is really the biological error. And I think that's the next sort of uh, great innovation that we're going to see in terms of management of these problems. So with all that and with all this innovation, I think it really begs the question of how good are we? You know, when you, when you, when you take someone to surgery and, and you fix them, you know, really, 
how good how 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 good are the techniques that we're using? And if you really look at the data, you know the argument can be made that we're only we're only sort of kind of okay. This is an often cited paper again crediting crediting Dr. Yamaguchi. Uh, this was an older study. Uh, they looked at large and massive rotator cuff tears, and they they looked back at the results. I think in about twenty two patients at one year with ultrasound and, and they found that 94% of the patients didn't heal. And so when you're reviewing lit the literature, this is an oftentimes cited paper where that this is the highest number of failures that you'll see. And you know that oftentimes just, I, th I believe throws out that shock factor. <clears throat> the reality is we have gotten better. The instrumentation, the techniques have gotten better. And really some of the more recent studies looking at the more common tear patterns being small to medium rotator cuff tears, we've gotten better, but still the, the failure rates are still up uh, roughly about in this paper alone, 33% of the patients at one year had failures of the repair. And I don't know about you, but if, if you're if we're doing hip or knee replacements and a third of the patients were not doing that well, I'm not quite certain that those are kind of things that we would necessarily tolerate. But for some reason, we think that's okay with rotator cuff surgery. So in terms of factors, in terms of predicting rotator cuff retears and failures, there's a lot of things that there's some things we just can't control, such as patient age. However, I would argue some of these other uh, factors, such as size of the tear, pliability, degree of fatty atrophy, I think these as clinicians, these are some factors that we can help sort of modify, at least or, or discuss with the patient. So if a patient presents with a small tear, educating them that, you know, these things can get bigger. And these are the risks and you know, these are the things to look out for so that you can avoid some of these you know, patients going away and coming back, say, five years later with now a small tear that's become a massive tear. Um, so I think you know, these are important things that we can sort of help patients out with. In terms of when failures occur, well, looking at Dr. Ainati's study, you know, they, they actually occur pretty quickly after surgery. So in his study, he looked at this by, by MRI and roughly 94% of the failures occurred within the first six months of surgery. And so when I look at this, you know, what this tells me is that, you know, there's got to be a problem with how, you know, the, the biology or the, how the tendon is hearing, adhering back to the bone, meaning that when we, when we fix it, the, the reasons that it failed to begin with being biology or blood supply, uh, it, th those things are not occurring after we fix it. So we've got to do something. We've got to be better in, in this early time frame to, to, to allow for better outcomes. Again, understanding failure rates. Well, I think, you know, our fixation, the suture material, the anchors, you know, it used to be where the suture would break or the anchors would pull out of the bone. But I think a lot of those problems have actually been improved. And this was actually a good study where they looked, went back and, and they saw how failures occurred. And it's really the suture, the suture now sort of cuts through the tenon. Again, going back to that simple fact that the tenon, for whatever reason in certain patients, is just not healing back to the bone. And so again, this goes back to the root, root problem is that we have to do something to, to improve the biology of the repair site. Or sometimes, as, as we've seen, sometimes our fixation is so strong that we get these type 2 failures or these trans tendon failures, and the, these are even more challenging conditions to treat. So really, that begs the question, why does this all matter? And, you know, again, I, th I think it goes back to the failures. <clears throat> and we, we're, we're in a situation now where we have an aging population, and in roughly about 20 years, nearly 20% of the population is going, going to be at risk patients, you know, patients 65 and older. So there's going to be a lot of people presenting to the doctor's office with shoulder pain and rotator cuff problems and, and having better solutions for this population and, and, and is, I think, going to be very important. In the United States alone, if you look at rotator cuff surgeries uh, performed, nearly half a million are done annually. If you then go back to that earlier slide where we looked at prevalence, and if we assume that of these rotator cuff repairs, 40% of these repairs include crescent-based or small to medium-sized tears, and again, referencing the 33% failure, that's going to equate to roughly 65,000 failures annually, with the numbers incrementally increasing every year as, as our population continue, continues to age. 
As this graph shows, however, when surgery is done and you have a good outcome, it's actually cheaper economically to the, to the society if you have a good outcome. So again, going back to what I stated, we have to be better about when we're putting people through surgery, we, we have to have better outcomes and better end results if we're going to put them through all this. Because ultimately, failures are not cheap. Revision surgery can exceed well over $50,000, especially if we go the route of reverse mania, as, as people now quote. So this begs the question, how do we improve? How do we get better? How do we learn from the mistakes? And how, would, how do we lessen our failures? And for me, what I've learned over the years is I now recognize risk factors or, or, or things that would pay, place the patient at a higher risk. So over the age of 55, again, something that we can't control, patient may have a smoking history, larger pattern tears, complex uh, pattern tears with either anterior or posterior uh, column disruption, any kind of delamination of the tear that you might appreciate on MRI, or if they come in with a history of multiple steroid injections. These are now the cases where I will now do something to improve the biology, either at both the anthesis or potentially improve the meat of the tenon with implants such as n body to help bolster up uh, the repair. And that ultimately involves better biology. And I think that's, again, the, the, the next era of how, how we improve from where, where we've come. So this is my case example uh, present now. now. This is a lady I saw uh, initially for her left shoulder. Uh, she presented with a history of a failed rotator cuff repair done elsewhere. Um, uh, the tenon was well retracted to the glenoid. Uh, she had like a supraspinatus tear, uh, an upper infraspinatus tear, had decent function, but significant pain had failed, <clears throat> failed multiple steroid injections. And on, on her, based on her younger age, I treated her with reverse and she had a very good outcome. Uh, she recently presented to me uh, for her right shoulder. Uh, she had reports of progressive pain over the past six months, pain with lifting and reaching, night pain. She was right-hand dominant. Again, she had attempted therapy and your conservative measures. Again, physical exam, pretty good motion. She had weakness. Uh, negative lag sign. Uh, she had good horizontal plane stability of, your, of her arm. And this was her MRI. So this is the coronal, as you can see, uh, pretty decent amount of meat of the supraspinatus. I, I, I interpret this as a supra anterior infraspinatus tenon. Uh, the sagittal, I graded this a, a grade two gutalier, uh, grade two, grade, grade three, negative tangent sign. So in my, you know, my interpretation of this is that this looked like still a repairable uh, tenon, uh, especially given her age. And, and you know, for me, learning, learning what I learned from her other shoulder, uh, this is a lady that I felt would benefit from uh, additional steps to potentially avoid the complications that she had on her left shoulder. So this was her at the time of arthroscopy. This is viewing from posterior. Um, you can see the supraspinatus, very pliable. She had an, I, what I called an early L, reverse L pattern, a tear where it was extending back into the infraspinatus sleeve was still mobile. And so I cleaned it up a little bit. And then again, from my goal when I'm fixed is I try to restore that crescent. So I, I start with a poster lateral anchor to, uh, to stabilize the back uh, infraspinatus first. I secured that and then placed uh, another couple anchors. Um, I then I also improved the, the anthesis with the, with the scaffold on adjacent to the bone. And then on the top side of the tendon, I deployed or utilized the, the embody collagen uh, implant this was placed through an anterior portal. It was easily deployed over the top of the tenon and then uh, secured in place with the resorbable staples. In this picture, I've already fixated it medially and then now I'm uh, implanting the staples laterally. And hopefully, you know, in, 
in this situation by by recognizing you know the, her her being at risk that this will hopefully equate to a better outcome. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Badman for an excellent presentation, which I think illustrates the current issues and challenges we have with treating rotator cuff pathology and trying to optimize the outcomes that our patients uh, are going to see. Our next lecture will be a bit more about the biology and chemistry of how we approach rotator cuff disease. And I, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Wasik Ashraf, who will take us out. Thank you, Dr. Scaglione. I'll be speaking about tapestry and the use in the rotator cuff indication. So the question that really comes up is why do we need or consider biologic augmentation? Mechanically, we have had a good understanding of how to pick the right rotator cuff to mechanically fix. We understand rotator cuff anatomy based on MRI of retraction, fatty degeneration. We also have improved sutures and anchors to, again, better mechanically fixate the rotator cuff down to bone. Advancements in surgical techniques trying to achieve a tension-free repair along with techniques such as microfracture or microchanneling, using a combination of single row, double row, knotless, knotted, all different types of technique to achieve a better outcome for our patients. But we still continue to have a high 30 to 94% failure rates of rotator cuff repair. So the reason for augmentation is why not? We have tried everything else. So this is a full thickness rotator cuff that we could see in the glenohumeral joint here. The tendon is retracted and is delaminated. So when we have a situation where we biologically have a rotator cuff that has a higher risk of failure, when we do our mechanical repair, we should also consider biologic augmentation to achieve a lower retail rate. So what are some of the mechanical factors we look at when we try to achieve a rotator cuff repair? We want to restore the rotator cuff footprint on the greater tuberosity. We want to maintain the pressure on the tuberosity while the healing is happening and also have a strong repair. Study by Dr. R. Sierro, cadaveric study, arthroscopy 2012, demonstrated that a double row repair is equivalent to a transosseous repair achieving a biomechanical fixation over the greater tuberosity. And this has also been shown in other cadaveric studies that a double row repair increases stiffness as well as the strength of repair. So for most rotator cuffs, a double row repair will allow for great mechanical fixation from small, medium, or even large to massive rotator cuff down on the tuberosity. But the clinical dilemma still remains. We still have rotator cuff failures at a high rate. Is this because of non-healing, incomplete healing, or recurrent healing? We do have an idea of where most of these tears occur. Most of these tears occur at the suture tendon interface. And it's not that the suture rips, it's that the tendon quality, the tendon shears through the sutures, not allowing that healing to happen, as well as to cause a re-tear of that rotator cuff. So when we consider biologic augmentation, we must consider what factors affect the quality of that rotator cuff tendon? We know from our uh, studies of looking at MRI images, looking at small, medium, large tears, and fatty infiltration of the rotator cuff, as well as chronicity of the rotator cuff tear, what factors can lead to a high failure rate of rotator cuff repairs? That includes tear size, fatty degeneration, the atrophy of the rotator cuff, tendon delamination, as well as tendon retraction. So when we see this on an MRI preoperatively, we already have an idea that although we can achieve a mechanical fixation at time zero, we may have trouble healing the tendon, healing that and achieving a good biologic reaction to get the tendon healed down to bone. But there's also other factors that are kind of more difficult to control, and that's our patient factors. And there are several challenges that we face when we pick our patients to fix their rotator cuff. We have an aging population, osteoporosis, increased BMI, increased 
patient comorbidity such as smoking, diabetes, dyslipidemia, as well as low vitamin D have been all linked to an increased rate of rotator cuff tearing. So as we consider which patients are, we are taking for a rotator cuff repair, we must pay attention to the patient factors and not just the tear pattern. So a role for biologic augmentation, as we kind of again discuss why we should consider this, is that mechanically we're pretty good at fixing the rotator cuff with improvements in anchors, sutures, techniques, but we are still struggling with the healing and increased retear of our moderate to large tears. So to improve quality of the tendon, as well as to modify the patient comorbidities, we should consider biologic augmentation for rotator cuff repairs. And what should be the goal of this augment? It should be to stimulate, promote tendon-like growth tissue, enhance cell remodeling, also uh, promote a uh, scaffold during which the tenocytes can grow uh, and align, and promote type 1 collagen formation. Make that tendon strong with new tendon-like tissue so the sutures and the tendon interface can have a better chance of healing. What are other augmentations that I have used and seen in the market? Dermal grafts. The issues with dermal grafts are that there's no induction of new host tissue. There's really no functional remodeling of the dermal patch as been shown by Dr. Osnowski at the two-year mark. A porous collagen implant such as tapestry allows for tendon-like tissue at the area of uh, the repair. It forms dense, collagenous connective tissue, and then it's fully absorbed. It also aligns itself along the same muscle fibers uh, that it's repaired to. In this uh, um, uh, picture, you can see the neighboring uh, native Achilles tendon is in alignment with the tapestry region that it's been repaired to. There's certain wants and don't wants when we think about biological augment um, and uh, growth of tendon-like tissue. We don't want something that's bulky, that's scar forming, something that covers the that doesn't cover the footprint. You want something that allows you to cover a whole footprint for the repair, limited size options, and something that will cause a reaction, an inflammatory reaction for the host. What we want is type one collagen formation, a coverage of a wide footprint for the tendon to heal down to the bone, increased porosity, and I can't um, emphasize this enough, the increased porosity and the ideal porosity allows for improved induction, remodeling, and tendon-like tissue, a controlled degradation of that tissue with fully absorption um, at a certain time, and then strong enough at time zero to hold sutures and tie sutures in an open or arthroscopic fashion and has to be easy to use and versatile in an open and arthroscopic setting, um, ideally. So open rotator cuff repair for an anatomic total shoulder replacement was my first use of tapestry as an augment, as an implant for my rotator cuff subscapularis repair. Reason for that is we know for anatomic total shoulder replacement, the two modes of the most common failures are glenoid loosening and rotator cuff tearing. The most common rotator cuff being the subscapularis. And this patient is a 43-year-old right-hand dominant patient with the above exam. But what I do know is that this patient wants to get back to everything, lifting, golfing, um, and heavy lifting. So their plan is to mechanically repair the subscapularis, but also to augment um, with an implant that'll help repair the tendon and decrease the retear rate. In this first video, you can see the peel that's done for the subscapularis, the pre-placed anchors, and the plan to get the tendon mechanically fixated to the lesser tuberosity. In the next video, you will see the mechanical fixation with the arm and external rotation of 30 degrees with no increased stress. But what we do know from rotator cuff repairs is that stress really affects the tendon suture interface. In the picture in the far side is the tapestry implant over the repair side, suture in each corner with a vicral stitch and in alignment with the subscapularis fibers with the large footprint coverage of the subscapularis.
So what we talk about now from the open setting for a subscapularis to a rotator cuff arthroscopic indication. This could be used for rotator cuff tears in the partial, articular, or bursal, as well as to augment full thickness rotator cuff uh, tears with an implant on the bursal surface. The process of placing the tapestry implant has been streamlined with these four components and instrumentations. You have a cannula, which is versatile, comes in different size based on the patient's body habitus. You have your introducer with the implant. You have your bone anchors, which are preloaded with two anchors, which could be used on the tendon and bone to again further streamline and speed up surgical process with less handling. And then you actually have the implant itself, which comes in various sizes. And we'll go over step by step of the tapestry rotator cuff. This is a 62 year old female smoker uh, who did not improve with non surgical treatment, uh, has a 30% bursal sided rotator cuff tear, and as you can see, a large anterolateral bone spur causing impingement in the subchromial space. This caused a 30% tear on the bursal surface of the rotator cuff. This is after doing the decompression of the subchromial space and using the spinal needle from your um, tip of your chromium to really find a great angle for your later anchor placement in the tendon and bone. And it's important this step to really decompress, debris. You want to visualize the rotator cuff, the lateral bursa, as well as get your angles for your anchor placement. This is the decompression again being completed. And now from the lateral side, coming in with the cannula. You can come with the cannula anteriorly or laterally based on how you like to position the implant over the rotator cuff. Uh, for me, I scope in the lateral position and I prefer the implant and the cannula coming from the lateral portal. Once that cannula is in this correct position, again, it has uh, versatility with multiple lengths based on the size of your patient and your patient's body habitus. So these are the components for the delivery part of the implant into the subacromial space. You have your cannula that is versatile with multiple sizes based on your patient body habitus. You, then you have your preloaded implant, which based on uh, if you want to come lateral or anteriorly, which will be open for the surgical tech. Once you're ready to place your implant in the subacromial space, you roll the implant, introduce it, through your cannula into the subacromial space. Once you have positioned where you want the implant to stay, you then bring the stopper from the introducer, which will attach to the cannula to improve your fluid management and also control bleeding. Once you're in the subacromial space, again, this is the implant coming in through the cannula positioned over the subacromial space. And this is when you would bring the stopper on the outside of the body down to the cannula, improving the pressure within that subacromial space. The implant introducer has two parts. It's a stopper that comes down to the cannula, also an actuator, which can be used to release the implant once you have provisionally fixated to the tendon or to the bone. The implant uh, comes in multiple sizes. Uh, it's preloaded for lateral or anterior insertion based on the surgeon's preference, and it's rolled and placed into the cannula for delivery, as mentioned before. And the actuator, will will demonstrate, will release the implant once ready. So this is the tapestry implant in the in subacromial space prior to initial fixation. I want to bring your attention to the anchors. This has multiple use. It has two anchors that are preloaded. There's a malleting surface, a rocker, and you can select your second anchor once you've used the first anchor. So as you see the video, you're coming in from the tip of the acromion from your predetermined angle. Once you're in, you press your rocker, which will introduce your needles with your first implant. You pick your position based on if you wanna be on bone or tendon and use your mallet to mallet the needles into the implant and then into the tissue underneath. You then press the rocker again, which will 
bring the needle back out and then you could select your second anchor using your anchor selector and use the second set of anchors in that same fashion. To disengage, once you've in, got your initial fixation, use your actuator. And as you can see, once you've used your actuator, you push in, lift, and pull back. And that will take your introducer instrument outside the subacromial space, and you would then come back in with your second set of anchors to fixate the implant over the rotator cuff. Biologic augmentation is important for rotator cuff repairs due to the known increased risks of re-tears based on size of the tear and patient comorbidities and patient factors. We have been very good at achieving a mechanical repair, uh, rest restoring the footprint of your repair, achieving excellent mechanical strength, but we still struggle in achieving healing of that rotator cuff repair or the biologic event, biological repair of the rotator cuff down to bone. The use of the tapestry implant, um, especially in the arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs will improve our biologic repair capabilities in rotator cuff repair. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, welcome everyone uh, to the live session, and I want to commend Drs. Badman and, and Ashroff on uh, very eloquent presentations. I think one of the things I wanted to start by saying is uh, I am very excited about uh, Embody Tapestry. I'm excited about innovation. I'm excited about perhaps making a difference. I think we all agree that there are significant challenges. And uh, I'm excited about the biology here. So um, what I'd like to start with is, uh, is in welcoming everyone is just point out to use the Q&A box for any questions and uh, for any of our panelists as we begin our, our discussion. Uh, a question first uh, to uh, Dr. Badman. In terms of, I think you very nicely outlined the indications, but in terms of stratification of pathophysiology, and let's just say the high-grade partials versus the uh, significant articulocited versus bursal-sided partials versus your complete tears. Uh, how do you approach this from an indication standpoint? How do you think about it going in, making judgment and decisions regarding what to use and when to use it? Yeah, I think that's always a good question. Um, you know, I, I definitely don't think that this is needed in every indication, but, you know, being doing this now and being honest with my, I have ultrasound, I think ultrasound in my hands has been one of the things that probably has changed the scope of my practice because I like to look at what the repair looks like. And, you know, after a while you start looking and I don't have a good poker face. And I realized that when, when you have a recurrent tear and you're looking at the patient, again, I, I, I can't hide that. So, um, but, you know, learning from my mistakes over the years now, you know, the things I predominantly look at, if they're, if they're 55 and older, we know that that's a higher risk population. I mean, the literature would suggest that one in five of those uh, 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 tears potentially don't heal just based on age. Um, so I also, I mean, I always go back to, you know, Dr. Gerber has got a good article where he looked at shortening of the tendon, the amount of retraction of the tendon, the amount of delamination of the tenon. If I see things and I think the tenon's still repairable, so I like to make sure that the, you know there's good meat, there's still you know greater than 15 millimeters thickness or a good stump of tenon that I can pull back. Because in my opinion, if it's past the glenoid and medial to the glenoid, those are those are tenons that that probably are not going to heal. And I think Gerber was in Gerber's hands, you know, grade three atrophy you know, less than uh, 15 millimeters uh, of retraction or residual tendon stump. I think the failure was like 94% in that article. So um, when I have a repairable tear though, and, and so, you know, things that, you know, good meat, uh, not a lot of atrophy, uh, at-risk patients, so smoke or anything, then th that's the time where I'm gonna augment. And I, I have a very low threshold to do that because again, you know, revision surgery, it's not a, it's not a minor thing. You know, and I think we expect a lot of patients, we put them through surgery, 
we put them through, you know, six weeks in a sling, two to three months of rehab. And then at, if at six months, you're looking at the patient and they're like, well, I didn't heal. It's like, why in the hell did we do that? So, you know, my justification, because I, I know that there's always going to be questions about added costs and things, but my justification for that are, are for those reasons. I want to have a good outcome, a healed tenant, you know, ultimately, I think is the, the end result of what we should be, you know, thinking about when we put them through this. Thank you. Dr. Ashraf, uh, expanding a little bit on indications uh, and mentioning uh, the revisions, because I think we're all seeing more revision rotator cuff surgery. Uh, where does that fit in uh, relative to the use of the embodied tapestry implant? Uh, is that something that I think uh, truly distills out the potential value here? Absolutely. You know, with revision surgery, we have patients that are, you know, as older as Dr. Badman kind of uh, talked about. We have patients that are more demanding, you know, more patients that want to go back to pickleball, they want to do everything and they don't want a shoulder replacement. And so these patients would have comorbidities and they've already shown a potential of retear with a revision surgery. I think you do everything you can to maximize their mechanical and their biological fixation of that rotator cuff. Um, and so that's where for revision setting, almost always I'm using a uh, implant uh, tapestry on the uh, bursal surface. And, uh, and also, Dr. Ashraf, I think you, you really, uh, you, you pointed this out very nicely uh, and eloquently. Uh, there are, uh, in, in my mind, and I think for, for what we're looking at, some very unique, innovative uh, design aspects of the Embody tapestry implant that I think for us, relative to maybe what we have used, make a difference. And you talked about several things here in terms of the actual ultrastructure and microanatomy of the implants. Can you tell us a little bit more about that uh, relative to why you've been uh, using and why you've decided to use this implant? Sure, absolutely. So I've used other implant uh, collagen and dermal uh, grafts. What really sticks out in tapestry is the porosity. I mean, this is a very porous implant uh, allowing to really maximize the, um, the, the biologic event that happened at the implant tendon junction. Furthermore, it's highly aligned. And so it really creates this very uh, connective tissue, um, kind of collagen-like connective tissue uh, over the native uh, rotator cuff or any tendon that you're repairing, allowing to increase its strength and stiffness and really um, improve the overall biologic event. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Badman, on that note, uh, one of the things that have been that has been a concern of mine uh, in the past with other implants has been the use of uh, non-absorbable anchors or peak anchors or anchors that, uh, that could float around. Uh, are there some advantages here in terms of the anchoring system and fixation uh, that provide a, a real advantage uh, for using tapestry in, in your hands? Um, yeah, I think, you know, having an implant that's resorbable, you know, you know, and I, I, to echo Dr. Ness, I, I have, I did, I was an early adopter of, of the, of one of the competitor collagen implants, and I, and I know a lot of people have used it, they've had some good outcomes, but I had a very bad experience with that. Um, if you go on my health, health grades, um, I have one patient that wrote me a really ask you review because that that implant had a significant inflammatory reaction so you know when i when i came over to embody again i use ultrasound i was very sensitive because i didn't want to see that because you know that implant works in a way where it almost creates like a, an abnormal thickening of the tendon so and that so as good as it may sound it's also can be very bad because patients come back and they're, they're painful and they're stiff and what have you so um, I like this implant thus far. I mean, I, as Dr. Ashton, I've used it on my initially started with total shoulder um, in reverse. And, you know, I followed those and I feel very comfortable with porosity and the way that this implant is different than the competition that, that I, I feel that, that this is superior, you know, and it's, I think it's going to be a good thing moving forward. Yeah. 
uh, question for either of, of you uh, is, uh, and this is from um, both from myself and also uh, one of our uh, participants tonight, and th that is, uh, tell me or tell us what is it that is truly uh, the advantage of using the tapestry implant? Um, are we getting uh, a significant augmentation of mechanical strength times zero? Are we getting uh, enhanced biologic augmentation uh, based upon cellular induction and chemotaxis and therefore, therefore uh, a more predictable healing pattern? Uh, you know, what is it that we, is it structural integrity? What is it that you, you think is really going on here that's providing the advantage? So why don't you take it first, Ash, Dr. Ashraf? Sure, absolutely. So, I mean, as I kind of talked about is mechanically, we've gotten pretty good at repairing rotator cuffs, you know, single row, double row, whichever technique. So really what we're trying to do is achieve biologic, um, kind of the biologic event, biologic healing. And so at time zero, using the tapestry implant with the bone anchors, you're not achieving mechanical uh, improvement of that repair. That repair, whichever way you have decided to fix it, you've had that mechanical footprint restoration. What we're trying to do with tapestry and why I use tapestry is really trying to get the tendon um, to be, uh, um, a better cell induction, more porosity for our uh, scaffold for the repair to really improve that tissue suture bone construct uh, going forth from then to 52 weeks. Uh, and Dr. Badman, um, I think uh, we would all agree that the holy grail and uh, in our quest for uh, dealing with rotator cuff disease would be uh, uh, a uh, faster healing, right? If we can deliver faster healing to the patient, uh, that's a that's a grand slam. And two, uh, uh, more predictable outcomes. So let's take the first one. And uh, can you share with us what your current post-operative protocol is? Let's take a high-grade partial bursal side tear, a little bit more. Uh, perhaps finicky than, uh, than, than the articular side. You don't do a conversion repair. You don't do a takedown. You're basically doing an in situ. You're adding the tapestry uh, implant. What's your post-op uh, uh, protocol? Uh, how long sling? When do you start uh, passive range of motion? When do you start strengthening? When do you return to stressful activity? Why don't we start there? Yeah, so I think uh, with that example, so partial tear with tapestry, um, you know, I think that that's going to result in a little bit of a more stable configuration. So I have, I'll, I'll put them in a sling for a couple of weeks and then I will then initiate therapy in a relatively quicker manner um, with the goal and, and strengthening. I always think strength should be the last, last thing to the table. Um, I still want them to probably not progress to a strengthening protocol, even in that scenario for probably a good couple months. Um, but I think early passive motion with this, you know, again, with the organization, the porosity and the way that, you know, the way that things heal, we know that if, if the tendency and the strain, it's going to align, the collagen fibers are going to align according to the strain that it's seen. So in that set setting, I think, you know, getting going a little bit quicker is advantageous. Yeah, like some stress, if you will, is good stress. Um, Dr. Ashraf, how about outcomes? I mean, that's again, that's the holy grail, right? We're going to, when we're all is said and done, we have better outcomes, which we need to measure. Uh, how do you measure outcomes? How do we basically uh, hold our feet to the fire and say, okay, we're making a difference uh, with this tapestry implant? Uh, are you using Clinical uh, outcomes, proms, uh, what is your scoring? Are you getting an, a repeat ultrasound at some point? Uh, are we doing other types of high resolution imaging? What's your, your current plan moving forward? So what I currently do with my rotator cuff and uh, along with the uh, tapestry protocol is, you know, I see the patients back at week six, uh, three months and six months, and we get the visual analog score as well as the patient assessment of ASCS questionnaire. And that's really what I'm using as my outcome. You know, unfortunately, you know, if you just talk about pain and just say, oh, this patient's doing great, it just doesn't work. We have to be accountable and really see how these patients do long-term 
with using patient reported outcome score. And that's currently what we're doing with Tapestry. Yeah. Brian Badman, my, my uh, ta ta takeaway with this, and I think all of us are here tonight to, to have a few takeaways uh, are relative to, I, I think, this implant being unique and, and having uh, biological and we'll call it architectural differences that are, are going to, I think, change the way uh, we approach this rotator cuff problem. What about, I think you mentioned and, and Dr. Ashraf mentioned, what about making this practical? So we're all busy, we're all taking care of a lot of patients. We need to be able to get the job done uh, not only securely in terms of fixation and delivery, but in a manner that is highly efficient in terms of uh, using our operative time. What has been your takeaway uh, with this implant and with the unique anchoring system and with the unique delivery uh, uh, methodology that makes a difference? What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, oftentimes the delivery, I mean, I think the fact that they, we have different size cannulas with this system is very ideal. I think the, the delivery uh, system is very unique. I mean, it, it easily is deployable over the top of the tenant. As we all know, if, you, if you're if you using something and it's clunky and it, it, if it slows you down, you're not, you may use it once and you're never going to use it again. So. I think, uh, I think the folks at Embody did a really good job in terms of designing a very streamlined system. You know, you've got two deployable anchors, so it's not like you're having to take, take an anchor out and put it back in. You know, you can fire two. You know, a lot of times you're fixating grabs on the medial side and then fixating it laterally. Um, so, I mean, the, the time, the, the applications that I've used this in, I mean, it's literally probably a five minute procedure to, to augment. So. I think that's super important in terms of time and efficiency and everything else uh, when we're using these things. I couldn't agree more. I think um, uh, I, I think you're absolutely spot on in terms of uh, the ability to do something that's very predictable, reproducible, uh, not finicky in regard to the anchors, uh, and something that I think uh, you know performs well. So, uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf, any other uh, from that standpoint, any other takeaways uh, relative to your experience thus far that we can share from an educational platform standpoint to sort of take this and, uh, and be able to uh, spread the word? Uh, the other part that I think makes this uh, delivery uh, device very uh, versatile is if you are working laterally um, and you're kind of crowding, you can bring the implant through the anti portal, which makes it much better visually and also allows for you to fixate uh, without a lot of crowding uh, with um, with the implant or the delivery device. I, don't, I think that's another great versatile um, uh, attribute of tapestry rotator cuff implant. Um, so that's another way it doesn't allow, it allows you to fix the rotator cuff whichever way you want and then really pick where you want to augment anteriorly or laterally. Have either of you uh, had any experience with, uh, are you, so are you using uh, an arthroscopic fluid pump? Are you using that pump and maybe going dry uh, for some parts of the procedure? Uh, any other tips that we can share with, uh, with our uh, registrants tonight? So I do beach chair, I use gravity. Um, I don't use a pump, I've never, it's just how I was taught. Um, and I've actually, found that for me doing beach chair, delivering it through the anterior portal has actually, you know, in my experience so far has been, been easier than going lateral, but um, I've done it both ways. I, I just like I said, for, for my technique and my approach, I, I think the, the anterior approach it has been easier with, with this system, so. And uh, uh, Wasik, you're using lateral to cube position, I think you mentioned, uh, and uh, any, uh, any pearls? Uh, based on your usage? Uh, so the, I, I do use a pump. I think biggest thing is you can't hit what you can't see. Do a thorough bursectomy, decompression, and really work and get the angle for your uh, bone or tendon anchors just so you have and make sure you can get to all four corners. I think that's been the uh, one of the um, important steps for any of this type of surgery. The one, if you have a really anterior tear that you're fixing, um, 
you know, uh, that those are ones where you may need to make an accessory uh, uh, portal over the acromion to get a better angle. But otherwise, um, it's really straightforward. And again, like uh, Dr. Badman said, less than five minutes, you can have the implant, um, have it anchored down and, uh, you know, get surgery done. Uh, Brian, uh, in terms of the, the, you know, one of the things that I think was brought up is not only the advantage of having truly bioabsorbable uh, anchors uh, that, uh, that complement the procedure, but anchors that work. So now we're using anchors on tendon. So we'll say tapestry implant to tendon fixation. And then we're using anchors uh, more laterally uh, where we're now going perhaps tapestry to tendon to bone. So uh, how, what's been your experience with these anchors in terms of how they behave uh, reproducibility of insertion and the, the ability to get out of the surgery and feel very secure about your fixation. Any thoughts? Yeah, the, 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 the design of the anchors was really good. Um, uh, there was occasional I popped one in and I wanted to take it out. And I decided to leave it in because it would look like it was going to be harder to pull out. And so I decided, you know, that was a, so that was my learning experience with that. The nice thing I like about these anchors over the Again, not not to compare, but you know the other system you use a peak anchor into the bone. You know sometimes those bone those anchors don't always sort of sit down, and so anything that would potentially pop up and they you know be floating around the subacromial space that would cause problems that that's a concern. So you know we have now the ability to fixate both tendon and bone with the same anchor. It's dissolvable, so. It, God forbid something does happen, which, I mean, things are going to happen. I mean, it's, it's the reality. Of it. If that were to occur, I, I would have less concern because I know it's going to dissolve. Yeah, it makes, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so we have a, about two minutes to go. Uh, and if there, I certainly encourage anyone if they have any questions at all. I also always say if anyone has any questions uh, that come up at a subsequent time, any one of our faculty uh, or obviously we teach a, a fair amount at different uh, uh, venues and, and locations and meetings. So we're always available to be contacted uh, by our colleagues uh, for advice, case uh, review, uh, pearls, and so on. Uh, as we begin to, to uh, wrap this up, uh, perhaps maybe uh, Dr. Ashraf, if you wanted to provide a summary of some of those takeaways that I think we heard over the course of the last hour that I think are, are, are probably the most important points for everyone to hear as they start to take a look at this new implant. Absolutely. So I think the, the real big takeaway is the role of biologic augment. We know there is a role because although we can do a great mechanical repair, the most frustrating thing as surgeons seeing the post-op picture, seeing the tendon and bone and the patients coming back with the re-tear. So to augment, uh, help decrease those re retear rates, using tapestry and to augment your rotator cuff repairs is a great tool in your toolbox. Um, the rotator cuff system allows you to deliver an implant that's porous, uh, highly aligned, and be able to turn it into connective-like tissue uh, over the rotator cuff tendon that you're fixing with streamlined fixation of anchors, both in the tendon as well as in the anchor. And so as we kind of talked about this easy fixation um, and something you should consider in your rotator cuff repair uh, in the future. And uh, Dr. Badman, I loved your slide, which shows sort of the, uh, the paradigm evolution of treatment and with the last part being uh, the addition of biologics. So uh, to that point, uh, um, in terms of everything from marrow venting or crimson duvet or microfracture or additional BMAC uh, that uh, we all, I think, are quite familiar with and may use. What is your takeaway and summary regarding uh, the advantages of biology here? And are you using anything else? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I think that's the next dawn of getting better. Um, you know, I think if, if you're not using something to, to improve your outcomes or recognize, you know, when these failures are occurring with patients that are at risk, I think you're not doing yourself or your patient any justice by continuing to, to do the same thing over. It's sort of like, you know, it's like, 
And that's, I think, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so I do like, I, I, so I'm, you know, I, I'm a firm believer. I think the, the in pieces. So I, I will augment on the, on the under surface of the bone and I do augment on top of the tendon as well. Because yep. I think that there's, there's, you know, both sides of those uh, of the coin are really where we have to address the problems at. Terrific. Well, I want to, uh, again, wrap this up. I, I, first of all, I appreciate everyone's time. I learned a lot. Uh, I certainly want to appreciate Drs. Ashroff and Badman for your expertise and sharing. And uh, I want to, again, uh, congratulate everybody on something that is extremely exciting and, and uh, appreciate the ability tonight to share this with the, with the rest of you. So uh, with that said, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.